Hello, I'm Professor Thompson, and this is the lecture video on Chapter 3, Public Health. Public health is uh, really talking about prevention of illness or injury amongst a certain group, okay? Prevention, not treatment, but prevention, trying to stop uh, an illness or injury from occurring. Even if, It could be pre, before it ever occurs, or after they have had a lar large number of people that have had illness or injury, okay? Um, and it's always about a specific group, so whether it be geographic or demographic, it could be uh, city, state, county, what have you, nationwide, uh, or it could be a demographic such as uh, age group or race. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's say we notice that a lot of the elderly are suffering from injuries from falls. Okay, that would be a specific group, the elderly and a specific uh, illness or injury, uh, which would be due to falls. So you would come up with preventative strategies to identify or solutions uh, for, for that issue. So the general definition of public health is the practice of preventing disease and promoting good health within groups of people. Sort of the same thing that I said, and EMS does have a role to play in this, but I'll give you some other examples of public health issues first. Uh, efforts to prevent and control communicable diseases. So every year we have the flu, right? Um, and what do you see? Flu vaccines everywhere. And that is a successful attempt for uh, of large organizations uh, to identify a public health issue and then provide strategies to prevent it. Immunizations, okay? So the flu is a perfect example. Uh, they also have nutritional programs. Obesity occurs... Uh, it's very prevalent, uh, in, especially amongst Americans. I think one in three adults is obese, and that's a large number of people. Uh, so that's a public health epidemic, obesity, because it can lead to certain disease and illness. Uh, environmental health monitoring and regulation is also an uh, example of a public health strategy. Injuries can be a public health issue. So you have your intentional or your unintentional Unintentional are much more prevalent. According to your book's data, 93% uh, of injuries, this is from 2014, 93% of injuries in 2014 were unintentional, meaning accidental. Okay, so they occur without the intent to cause harm. Where your intentional injuries usually occur in the context of violence. So somebody that self-harms or wants to commit suicide or uh, you know, intentional overdose, or it could be caused by somebody else, like uh, assault would be an intentional injury. And those are divided uh, between the two, intentional and unintentional. And then you have your risk factors. Risk factors are characteristics that increase the likelihood that somebody's going to become injured. So age would be a risk factor. The older you are, the more risk there is to uh, you having an injury from a fall, right? So age is a, is a risk factor. Socioeconomic status could be a risk factor. Uh, gender could be a, a race could be a risk factor all of these things depending on what you're talking about unintentional un unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death in children ages 19 and younger I know if you're 19 you're not a child but anybody under the age of 20 the leading cause of death is unintentional injury why is that does that make sense well think about it uh, when you're under the age of 20 you don't have as many comorbidities as an older person does such as heart disease or uh, atherosclerosis or, you know, coronary, like I said, heart disease, coronary artery disease, uh, diabetes, hypertension, all of those things you get at an older age. I mean, you could have some of them at a younger age, but it's not as prevalent, right? But you get those things at an older age, and that's why people die when they get older from all of those things. Now, Oh, kids can still be uh, obese. Uh, I think one in every five kids right now is obese. And that is a public health epidemic, but they don't generally die from that obesity at such a young age. All of the, the health effects of being obese occur later in life. So because they don't die from all those medical causes, they tend to die from unintentional injury. That's the leading cause of death. Now, they can get cancer, and that is a high... Uh, Prevalence of, of death amongst kids is cancer, but unintentional injury is, is number one. And then they have risk factors for those injuries. 
age, gender, socioeconomic status, developmental stages, and the family environment. Obviously, if they're, they're much younger, they can't protect themselves. Uh, socioeconomic status, and you know, people in poverty are much higher risk of certain injuries or illnesses. And then family environment, if you understand that one, uh, you, if you have a stronger family environment, you have less risk. A weaker family environment, you have more risk. What do I mean by that? A single mother with six kids is, has higher risk for, the, for those young children to be injured. Okay, there's just not enough of her to go around, right, to, to watch the children all the time. Um, doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that there's more risk there. Or if, let's say, if, if the parents have a drug or alcohol issue, then those kids are at higher risk for injury. Let's talk about other public health threats. Chronic disease. Chronic disease is a public health threat. Now this statement, each year 7 out of 10 Americans die from a chronic disease, is a little hyperbolic. It really should say, people, of people that die, 7 out of 10 of them die because of chronic disease. We don't have 70% of all Americans dying from illness, uh, but 7 out of 10 people that do die, die from chronic disease. And what is a chronic disease? Diabetes, uh, kidney failure, hypertension, heart disease, arthritis, obesity. Now obesity is a chronic disease that can be treated and fixed. Uh, and I guess kidney failure could too if you had a, a good kidney transplant. And so those are your chronic illnesses. They don't just come and go. Uh, one in every three adults is obese. I already said that before. Uh, and again, that one, one can be fixed, but that causes a lot of morbidity. A one in five kids, as I said before, is obese. Uh, and then, uh, or one in five, I'm sorry, one in five young adults, but between or between the ages of 2 and 19, so I guess under the age of 2 is not as prevalent, of course. Uh, One-third of people with a chronic illness encounter basic or social problems that impair daily life. Kind of goes without saying. Let's talk about acute illnesses uh, because that affects public health as well. Kind of give you a timeline here of the acute illness that occurred. Uh, you had H1N1, in the flu, back in 2009, the H1N1 flu. It was first discovered in April 2009, and the, the U.S. declared a state of public health emergency. Two months later, in June of 2009, the World Health Organization said it's a global pandemic. They declared a global pandemic within two months. A few months after that, in September of the same year, the Food and Drug Administration approved four vaccines to prevent the disease. Now, we know that's fast, right? Uh, the FDA doesn't approve medications that fast generally, but we have a, a pandemic, so... Vaccines can be approved much quicker. And it's a good thing because within a year, August of the next year, August of 2010, uh, the pandemic was over. The World Health Organization declared an end to the emergency. So this is kind of a good argument for vaccines, uh, especially when it comes to things like the H1N1 flu. There's other things that can cause uh, these types of epidemics or pandemics. Water, seafood contamination, or all food, right? Because we... Not, not long ago, E. coli affected romaine lettuce, and you had a big recall, so that's a public health issue. Uh, radiation leaks, lack of sanitary conditions following natural disaster, increased incidence of cancer after major incidents. All of those things can cause public health issues. One that's not mentioned here, the opioid epidemic, right? It's a national epidemic. It's killing a lot of people, and they're trying to find uh, ways to prevent it from occurring. So all of those things can be uh, looked at as public health events or public health issues. There is a cost to these, these uh, issues, the public health issues, uh, illnesses, injuries. And that cost is equated through years of potential life lost. What is that? Years of potential life lost. Well, what they do is they take the number 65 because that's what they're going to consider the, the age that you can work up to. Okay, in general. So the number 65, and then they take the age of somebody dies. So let's say car accident, somebody dies, uh, they're 20 years old. So a 20 year old is driving, they die in a car accident, and you take that number 20, you subtract it from 65, and you end up with 45, and that would be the years of potential life loss for that person, 45. And then what they would do is they would take all car accidents and all people that die in car accidents, and they would find the years of potential life loss for all of those people, and then they would add them together, and then they'd have the total years of potential life loss. And if it's a big enough number, it could be an epidemic 
uh, or a very costly issue that they're going to now come up with preventable strategies for. And it seems kind of, uh, not to be ironic, but cheap that they're only going after the issue because it's got a big cost, right? Because the cost is that there's, they're, they're not earning income anymore, right? Because they're dead. They're not paying taxes and they're not contributing to society. So there's a cost. But this is a real thing. They do look at these things and that's why they'll identify public health issues and public health threats. So looking at this chart here, you see unintentional injury is number one. Uh, why is that? Well, we just said it's the leading cause of death in everybody under the age of 20. Well, if it's the leading cause of death, death in everybody under the age of 20, then you add up all of those people uh, and you end up with a lot of years of public of uh, potential life loss, right? Uh, 2.4 million in 2014, according to your book's data. And that's because there's so many people and so many of them were young. So there's a lot of years of potential life loss. Following that, you see malignant neoplasms. What does that mean? Cancer. Malignant neoplasms is cancer. And again, that happens amongst the young population, you know, it also happens amongst the older population. So you're adding all of those years of potential life loss together and you end up with 1.7 million. So this is just a chart with a lot of data on that year of potential life loss. When you start talking about public health, you start looking at this data and coming up with... Now, this the best public health uh, ish, strategies find the thing that's affecting the most people. You know, So here, we would say unintentional injury. We need to find a way to prevent this. Now, when you start obviously diving into it, you realize, oh, well, unintentional injury is a motor vehicle accident as well as it is um, somebody falling off a cliff, you know? So how do you prevent all of those things? And then you have to find which one is the, the most prevalent. It would probably would be motor vehicle accidents. And that's why there's so many strategies to prevent people from dying from a motor vehicle accident. Now let's talk about the teachable moment because this is potentially the, the best way you as a paramedic have to help uh, have an impact on public health, okay? The teachable moment is that moment in someone's life uh, following a near miss. So let's say somebody was in a car accident. They weren't wearing a seatbelt. They were in a car accident and they're fine. They didn't get injured. They didn't have any severe injuries. Now, you don't want that to be reinforced. You don't want the behavior of not wearing a seatbelt to be reinforced because they didn't get injured. You want to reinforce good behavior uh, by telling them, you know, hey, I've seen people in uh, accidents not nearly as bad as this uh, die because they weren't wearing a seatbelt. And while that seems severe, they're going to remember that. They're going to remember that interaction. And hopefully it's reinforcing uh, the right behavior, you know, wear a seatbelt. To them because they're going th again this isn't just another call for them like it is for you they they don't have car accidents every day it's a big event in their life they're building memories they're taking in information we can provide them with some information to help them make smarter decisions in the future so that's just uh something to take home that teachable moment and it it could be after somebody tries to overdose or tries to hurt themselves anything you find those moments where somebody seems receptive now, don't be judgmental. You don't want them to remember you being a jerk or anything like that. Uh, you, you don't want them to become defensive. You just want them to think that you care or other people care about them. And maybe they didn't know. Maybe they just something, oh, you know, I was just driving to the store and back. Well, tell them, you know what? That's where most accidents occur, close to your house. They might not know these things. So use that teachable moment to help uh, provide prevention. When we're talking about prevention, they have what they call the four E's of prevention, education, enforcement, economic incentives, and an engineering or environment. So here you see a paramedic teaching a kid to wear a, a bicycle helmet. That would be education. All, you know, Going out to schools, talking about swim, swimming safety or water safety would be education. Enforcement, uh, you see a, a police officer pulling over a van here. Let's say there's a law that you can't text while driving. Well, that's an enforcement way to prevent injury. Uh, engineering, airbags. Airbags are an automatic prevention. They're built into cars. And there is an enforcement component to that too because it's a law for auto manufacturers to put in airbags. But the engineering component of it, it things are built like helmets, you know, to be safer, to prevent injury. And then you have financial incentives. Uh, 
or economic incentives. Here you see a picture where it says student driver and, and that, what that's trying to remind us of is, is there's some programs out there where you take certain driving courses and you could save money on your car insurance, right? So that would be an economic incentive. So the four E's of prevention. Automatic protection would be like I was talking about with car seats and they're passive and you don't have to have any human interaction to put them in place. Another example would be a sprinkler system inside a commercial building. So if a fire were to occur, the sprinkler system would automatically try to put the fire out. Those are great strategies, but a combination of all the strategies is really the most important. Why should EMS be involved? Well, EMS should be involved because we're trusted by society. We're looked at as experts when it comes to injury and illness uh, prevention. Uh, and there's a lot of us and we're spread out, right? And we're typically normal people. We're not government bureaucrats. So we, people that are healthcare consumers realize that we're advocates for them because we could be a healthcare consumer as well. We're not just some person that they elected. So primary prevention happens before the injury occurs. So you might go out before the summer when you know a lot of kids are going to be swimming and provide a big swim class or talk about swimming safety to try to prevent drownings. Secondary prevention occurs after the injury happens. We already talked about why EMS providers should be involved. Um, a couple more listed here. Uh, the we're welcome in schools and other environments. And like I said, we're widely distributed. Uh, and I like this sentence, they may be the most medical, sophi medically sophisticated person in a rural community. Well, I'd like to think we're very sophisticated outside of rural communities as well. Here you see a big sign that says stop heroin. Obviously the opioid em epidemic is a big one, but we've had similar ones locally, uh, campaigns locally for public health, such as stop the bleed. Uh, CPR classes, you do a large CPR campaign, AEDs, AEDs, the 100 by 100 within Lee County. Um, those are all public health strategies. <clears throat> what is the Haddon Matrix? The Haddon Matrix was created by William Haddon Jr. He was a, a physician. He created the matrix that identified several principles of injury prevention. Added factor of time to previous models to address causes of injury. And he, he looks at the factors, and he looks at sort of the time as well. So you have factors, and then you have the time, like the pre-event, event, or post-event, okay? And I'm going to skip over here to the hat-on matrix. Here's one for childhood motor vehicle occupant injuries. So kids that get hurt in vehicles. These are preventable strategies, or prevention strategies, excuse me. And they're separated by these factors, whether host agent environment in this case host is the human agent is the car seat or vehicle and the environment is is always going to be your environment uh, whether it be inside or outdoors and then you have the different stages or times uh, pre-event during the event and post event and if you go through I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about a couple I'm not going to read the whole thing but if we were looking at the host which would be the human in the pre-event okay wear seat belts Use car seats. Ensure the babysitter, daycare, and extended family members use car seat. Drive defensively. So that's how humans can prevent childhood injuries. Okay? Uh, during the event, the driver maintains control of the vehicle. The driver is belted. The child is restrained. After the event, bystanders are trained in first response. So this is the, your education strategy right here. Uh, EMS personnel are expertly trained in treating pediatric injuries as well as car seat and seatbelt extrications to prevent further injury. Okay, so all of these things listed on this chart are ways to prevent injury. And they're specific, in this case, to childhood motor vehicle uh, occupant injuries. And that's how they come up with uh, different ways to prevent uh, injuries in public health. So let's summarize in, in this video here. Uh, the field of medicine continues to uh, dedicate more and more attention and resources to the mission of public health, promoting health and wellness, preventing injury and illness, because it really does benefit everybody. I mean, cost-wise, it's going to benefit the healthcare system. Um, we're just, the healthcare system is just very taxed. EMS is taxed. You know, the strain on the healthcare system can be affected by 
you know, implementing different public health strategies. Community paramedicine would be one to look into. If you could Google community paramedic, that would be one that EMS has kind of identified as uh, a way to sort of get into the public health arena and uh, slow down readmittance or your frequent flyers and uh, provide a, a benefit really to everybody. It, it, it's a benefit to the consumer or patient. It's a benefit to the healthcare system. It's a benefit to the local government. Um, so public health really is a, a huge topic in EMS, even though it's uh, one that you don't hear very often talked about. Start thinking about how you can make a difference in your community when it comes to public health and then EMS specific. Think about things that affect EMS within your community and try to think of different ways that you could help improve uh, the prevent prevention strategies uh, for those illnesses and injuries.